when you ask any person the question directly who you are who are you you might get uh, a lot of uh, psychological reaction because you're trying to with such a question to interrogate the source of the individuality of the of the being there is a story it's an old uh, Jewish uh, joke about a lady that dies and goes to heaven so then whoever is there I mean uh, you can have whatever deity you want to put in there goes there and asks who are you she wants to enter heaven who are you and she said my name is and and, uh, and, uh, and the deity the angel says I didn't ask you what's your name I ask you who are you and uh, and she says well I'm an engineer I didn't ask you what's your job uh, and, and then the angel keeps saying who are you and she says I'm the wife or the, I didn't ask you who your husband is so and then and, and goes on and on and the story the, the point of the story is how difficult it is for a human being to answer a question that should be so simple but evidently it's not uh, there is a poet that uh, I believe is one of the greatest poet of last century but definitely the greatest uh, uh, poet of the um, 20th century in Portugal who was Fernando Pessoa who used to make of this uh, multiplicity of this uh, abundance of personalities and entire literature Pessoa is an author that wrote poems and essays and books under uh, several um, different names they're called heteronyms that sometimes are even their writing that really if you don't know that it's the same person you would think these are three five six different authors but they're not because Pessoa made of this multiplicity of this abundance of being inside the humans a key trait of his poetry but at the same time is a great is a fine psychologist because Pessoa to the question who are you would reply yeah which one and somehow every person every individual can relate to this uh, type of stories and you see even if people don't have a clear conscience of that when they say oh, when I was young when I was a boy or a girl when I was when I was it means you're not anymore it, the, the point is that to make it more clear who are you is a direct question that re requires a direct and unique answer but you're not asking about a being that is unique that is that, sorry that is uh, I was thinking of Adorn of, of, of Marcuse uh, you're not asking a being that has just one dimension Marcuse wrote a book called the one dimensional man and this one dimensionality is seen as a sickness not as a feature of the human personality that's why it's so difficult to answer that question because that question is formulated in an ambiguous way you can go a little bit back in time with that think of the most important or very famous question asked by Moses on Mount Sinai that's the only point in the Bible where a human being can ask the Almighty who are you what is the answer the answer is a big problem because the that has been translated by in the Latin Bible called the Vulgata by Girolamus as Ego sum qui sum. I am what I am. Like 
like the song, the famous song, I am what I am. Now, the Lord, it's a very strange answer. First of all, because Girolamus translates a Jewish concept into a Greek concept. This I am what I am, is, it, it sounds like Parmenides, but cannot be because it's a, it's, a, it's a text that has no relationship with Parmenides, although there is a certain monism that could be uh, related. But here's the thing. Uh, the original text says, a year, a share, a year, which means I will be what I will be. So the request for the being is turned into a promise. That's why the Jews says we are the people of the promise. And the promise is, I will be with you until the end of time. You cannot ask the Lord a definition of who he is, because he's infinite, is absolute, is omnipotent, etc., etc., etc. Is inf the infinite attributes that he has. So it would be absurd to give an answer that is that could define because the, the divine cannot be defined but here's the point the Bible also says you are made in image of the Lord this means in the human there is also this infinity that is also undefinable One of the big problems of um, modernity and especially of our time is that words have been turned in what they are not. So there are a lot of concepts uh, that uh, they've been brutally uh, transformed in things that they are not. And individualism, for example, has become a synonym of uh, uh, egoism, but it's, it's, it's a very, very, very far-fetched uh, interpretation. Um, also because the contemporary man tends to um, identify individualism with narcissism. It's what we were discuss discussing earlier. Um, today it happens a lot to see people that, um, male, female, doesn't matter, saying, oh, I like him or her because... Uh, he has the same taste as me, or he likes the same colors, we uh, uh, love the same sport team, we blah blah blah. And the point is that you, you see the problem there. The person believes, it, the person is so narcissistic, uh, he became so narcissistic that can only like, I would not use the word love, someone that it's like him or her. Basically, they don't want a partner of a, or a person to love or be loved. They just want a copy of themselves. If they could find a technology that allows them to clone themselves, they would be the happiest people in the world because they are deeply narcissistic. And narcissism is one of the big plague of modernity but if you ask me what what narcissism is I would say that first is a non-concept and second is a fake individuality because narcissism is based to an excessive uh, infatuation again the word love is too high to be used in such context infatuation with uh, with himself but if you see the message of the Greeks what is the basic behind the, the myth of Narciss Narcissus is that you love something that is fading reflects an image something that is not there because the Greek have a great, great sense of uh, of human life in, in, in the sense that it is unique but it is also something that disappears. There is a, a dialogue by a very deep author, unfortunately not much appreciated, it was uh, uh, Lucian. 
Lucian uh, from uh, uh, Sam Samos and this P this work is called the dialogues of the dead in them Lucian is talking to dead people he goes to the other world and he sees the ashes of Ellen of Troy the most beautiful woman of Greece that the Greeks have fought a war because of her and Lucian asks a question to her and says what happened with all, all your beauty? All that made you proud is just now little dust. So the Greeks had a very profound sense of this. So that's why they were in love with beauty, but not with the subject of beauty. Well, not the one that I, we understand. Yes, today. absolutely. For example, for the Greeks, uh, beauty is harmony. We don't understand the concept of harmony. I uh, think our society denies, rejects any form of harmony. You just have to enter any museum of modern art to see that there is everything but harmony. There are broken, even in architecture. We have, for, for some reason, for some reason which is ideological, again, our society has forgotten the straight line. It is forgotten. It's not there anymore. There is, no, there is no architect, no genius architect that can make a building just using straight lines. It's impossible to them. A bridge, anything. Because a straight line is a form of harmony. Or a perfect curve is a form of harmony. We try to break this harmony. We try to leave the disharmony that... You see, I believe that we um, always make statements about ourselves, even as a society. So a society that is, that is deeply imbalanced will make a lot of the statements that state that are statements of imbalance. Because I cannot see anything that is that contains harmony, that contains symmetry, that contains beauty. I have to recognize beauty in ugliness. And that goes not just that goes everywhere from the individual that is reduced to a very little thing to architecture, as we mentioned, to music. I mean, again, try to mentally recap what is called music. It's a, it's, it, it's, it's a series of noises that would make shame the, the last of, the, of our ancestors for 20,000 years, where they were already more evolved than just um, with, the, with the drummers. Also what passes today for music but if you look behind and consider what we just have said you see that it's disharmony it's our incapability to see beauty to see harmony to see a straight line a beautiful curve impossible for us everything should be fragmented broken creeped destroyed annihilated and that's a reverberation, it's a reflection of the human being, of the ich, of the I, of the individuals that doesn't even recognize himself. The Delphi temple had uh, 147 different uh, quotes that we discovered. Those were, you know, the most famous is the uh, know thyself because of Socrates and uh, the story that Plato uh, tells us about Socrates. But uh, um, there were many more maxims or uh, proverbs or sayings on the walls of the temple in Delphi that were as relevant as this one. There were also strange ammunitions or um, way on how to behave, how to deal with your wife, uh, this type of things. So it, it was a very... Because temples were a repository of wisdom. And of course the, the wisdom of, of know yourself, which in Greek is uh, gnosis auton. Now, 
if you see the word gnosi gnosi um, it means knowledge per se but could be also translated in be aware of yourself you see you have the gnostics for example that there are people that brings a different knowledge to the world you know that makes a religion based on knowledge now it's the same word used you know this be aware of something know something so it's you can translate know thyself which is the common translation but also in be aware of yourself again you know the Greeks used to play with the double meanings of things but if you ask me what uh, would be the most important sentence or maxim from the Delphi temple to me always struck this one saying think I, I, I translate it's a very difficult translation but I, I'll translate approximately think like a mortal it's beautiful because it's also this idea of understand that life is finite that life has a limit that life is think like a mortal implied is don't think you are God don't think you are infinite don't think you are immortal you know this could be the reversal of the question I could have asked the masters of the universe instead of saying tell me something true the reversal would be think like a mortal you are not thinking like a mortal you're thinking like you are immortal therefore you are you are an idiot and you're turning the entire society into idiocy this adoration for the ancient would say for what it disappears there is no connection between what we understand as I and what the Greeks understood as uh, the self but for so many reasons not just the language the culture the, the concepts when you think that one concept that defines modernity in a very ill and disastrous way is the concept of will you have Schopenhauer who writes books uh, the, the, um, the the world as uh, will and representation Die Welt als Wille und Vorstellung uh, you have uh, the, the, the same concept emerging in Nietzsche, the, the Wille zu Macht, the will to power. You have the same concept emerging in the Nazis uh, with uh, Leni Riefenstahl, the, the Nazi director uh, that was making uh, one of the most famous documentary is, a, is about the, the Triumph der Willen, yeah, the triumph of the will. Now, such a concept that is also related to a sick ego, it's not present in the Greek culture. The Greek do, do not even have the word for will. So when you talk, uh, uh, the, uh, the high has been shaped in modernity in ways that are completely f impossible to understand for the Greek world probably the Roman world could understand us very well because we are very Romans but uh, the eye of the moderns you see one of the defining crucial thinkers in modernity is Blaise Pascal and Blaise Pascal was before was a mathematician and then he became a theological a, 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 a theologian and there is one very important sentence in Pascal that uh, I believe is extremely relevant he, Pascal used to say le moi est essable which means the I is des despicable is hateful because uh, for s many reasons you know among them the separation that implies the modern eye between you and the world you see the ancient didn't have this concept of separation we even uh, consider that their freedom was different from our freedom because it was related to community 
because it was a communitarian dimension, because the Greek individual was part of a community. We are not a part of a community. Then what do we do? We retreat into the eye. But that's not a victory. That's a defeat. A retreat is not a victory. So we retreat in the eye because we cannot recognize any more community, any more communitarian values, any more relationship to the society, to the police, the Greek would say, you know, their city-state. So we affirm a defeat as a victory. The Greeks did not believe that you are born human. They be believe that you become human. That's a very important distinction. Now you might think, of course, it's tribal, it's, 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 it's a very ancient way of considering the world, but if you read Freud, you would see that Freud uses a similar concept when he's saying reason is not a given. You're not born with reason. It's acquired later in life with development, with society, etc., etc., etc. These are very important things, extremely important concepts, because it means if we assume the Freudian concept or the Greek concept, that which our manipulators, for example, they, they know this concept very well, that the I, a large part of what we consider the I, is social is socially determined. Think your language, for example. People don't understand how their language determines their way of thinking. If you speak in one language or in another, it makes a difference in your th thinking patterns. That's why people who speak several languages tend if they, the, if they speak in one language and they don't have that concept, tend to switch to another language to grab that concept that they don't have in this language. But if you know just that language, you don't know that you can express that concept in a different way. Um, one example would be... Um, think one important category. Gram it's a grammar category, like the dual. In, our, in the language, most languages... There is plural and singular. So if it's one, it's singular. If it's many, it's plural. What about two? Like scissors, like trousers. So these cultures had a different grammar category called dual to express things that are two, that we don't have. So because we don't have, for us, three apples and Scissors are, or that they don't have differences, you know. Actually, scissors is one, and the apples are three. So, apples are plural, scissors is singular. For a Greek, scissors is dual, and apples are plural. See how your language already is influencing the way you construct meaning, you see the world, you interpret reality. That's why it is so beautiful that children, for example, when they are very little, they have their own language. They have a language that is still not social, doesn't have the mark of the social language. Mostly, of course, I mean, we don't want to go there. It's a, it's a complicated uh, topic, the children language. But all of this to say that the construction of the I could also be, and it is, unfortunately, in too many cases, a social construction. That's why the Greeks say you're not born human because if you don't separate yourself from that amount of things that have been inserted inside of yourself you are still, you know, copy and paste. You're still a one-dimensional man as Marcuse used to say. If you want to become human, probably I would Today we would not use that word, you know, we would say you want to grow up, we would use that in more in a Kantian sense, you know, Kant says if you want to be enlightened, if you want to be a rational being, you know, try to be 
an adult. And being an adult means try to think with your own mind, etc. But it means also get out from that universe that has been imposed, that has made you in a way that you would not be if you would have been born in a different place. If I would have been born in India, probably I would love uh, curry, chicken with curry. Uh, or if... Uh, try to ask any Italian, um, 90% they love, they love pasta. Which is strange if you go to the US where 3% probably eat pasta daily, you know? So th that's a cultural aspect. What is your life going to be if you don't question anything, if you take everything that comes from uh, critically from your tradition, from your language, from your culture, what happens with you? You become what? You become just a... Could be like a, I don't know, a, a little terracotta or you, you, you're not you. You did not take that time, no thyself, to investigate yourself. To, to to search what is really you that's what what we were discussing earlier there's a core and in that core in in human beings that it's the real you that it's the who you are but if you cover that core with your culture, with your the ideas that they put in your mind, and you don't question them. You take the, you will be an eternal child. You will be someone who will never grow. You, I mean, you can grow even reinforce the beliefs of your cultures. That's that's even possible and legitimate. But it's a process that you've done. You see, the equivalent of the know yourself which is again we have to keep reiterating in a temple is in one of the mysteric cults of the Greeks the Greeks had cults called mysteries and the mystery said we know very little about and they had hundreds of these different cults but one of the main mysteries had a series of trials you had to go through, you know, you see that in the myth, for example, in Hercules that has to kill the Hydra, kill the snakes. And those are stages in your individual evolution. You can read the myth, uh, not uh, just the fight against the Hydra, but also stages into your personal evolution. Now, you know which one is the last mystery the greatest mystery of the Eleusian mysteries that are the most important mysteries in Greece when you s went through all the trials all the proofs fighting this doing that resolving that uh, enigma Oedipus for example with the Sphinx eh? what is the last and the greatest enigma it's a book that when you open it contains a mirror there you are. That's exactly the point. Know thyself. Because otherwise you will never grow. You will never be. You. How can you give an answer to that question? Who are you? If you never kept yourself busy with that question. If you never even challenged those people coming to you and telling you are this. You are that. You have to accept if you don't. And then you are just what others decide you are very dangerous because it's an annihilation of your life there is a sent there is a famous uh, statement saying some people die, uh, die at 20 and they get buried at 70 but that's exactly what it means you know because you haven't lived your life you've lived the life for, that someone else told you to live because told you, you are that, you are that and you have to do that. You know, this is something that you can relate a lot with uh, also uh, previous uh, situation of oppression. Think of the role of the women in certain societies and in certain moment of history where the society says, you are just a wife, you cannot go to work, you cannot vote, you cannot do this. If 
there would not have been women questioning this and saying, wait a minute, they would live the life that someone else imposed them to live. I'm not saying there's anything wrong in being a wife or anything, but it should be your choice, not somebody telling you. The point is choice. That's always... Because if you see, if you go a little further, you will see that the real individuality is always connected with one key concept. Freedom. You don't have real individuality without freedom. If you want to be a mass, if you want to be a we, whatever that we is, could be a sports team or a political uh, gathering or whatever, first you want to abdicate your ability to think because somebody else thinks for you. S uh, second, your freedom goes together with your thinking. And in the third place, you will avoid, and this is a topic that has been studied a lot and discussed a lot by a lot of sociologists and studies, you avoid human responsibility. It's that kind of mentality, oh, I did because everybody else did. Oh, you know, uh, everybody was gassing, uh, was sending juice to the, to the gas chamber, so I did what everybody else did. So this art of de-responsabilization that coincides to an annihilation again of yourself. You are denying yourself the freedom and the right to be you. To be a we, an indifferentiated we. But that's, uh, you know, where we are we in death when people are dead all deaths are equal they don't have taste they don't have feelings they don't I'm at least as far as we know so you want to be dead when you want to be a we the individual that's why it is see that's why it is key the individual is a key to democracy to freedom to so many concepts that's why it is so dangerous what we are doing that we are going far away from the concept of the individual it is extremely dangerous because on the individual lays the foundation the ethical foundation the moral foundation the civil foundation of the society whoever needs fear whoever needs uh, chief that will think for himself or herself is destroying himself or herself in the first place some people would say oh I have no problem with that because I've been destroyed already by an oppressive society by an ideological society by a way of living that makes me despise myself to the point that I just want to be a we so to forget that I'm an I it's a, that's why it is also a, such an important concept the concept of the individual because on that is based not just our self but also the liberty of us all If you really look at this, what do you see? It's an empty pedestal. And then there is a word saying I. So is I empty? Of course, in their intention it is that everybody should climb of the thing and say I. But if I then let's make another thinking experiment. Take hundred pictures of hundred different people on that pedestal saying I then who is I is the first is the second is the third can a mug a red mug be a blue mug or a green one if I instead of a human being I put a red mug a blue mug a yellow mug and then I say which one is the mug you cannot say it's the yellow or the red 
or the blue. So you have to find something that unites them all. Again, who is this I? Is the blue, is the red, is the yellow? None of them, or as you said before, all of them, or it is something that is above them, beyond them. It is a feature that uh, is there, but uh, is more than being there. You know, it's uh, the point is that the word I, it's singular and plural at the same time on a philosophical level. Because you're right, I mean, hundred people, they can say I, but there is no I that is just the I. So this brings us back to what? To an ancient story, an ancient uh, phrase of the Talmud that says, whoever saves one life, saves one entire world. Because each one of this I is a universe per se. That's why in the Bible you have the biblical myth of Adam that was created alone. Why? Because if you kill just one human being, you kill the entire world. So, and this is a perspective into the preciousness of life, but also in the uniqueness of life. Yeah, there is another way to interpret this so-called monument, because if you look at, at it and you don't know what's the intention behind it, you might think it's a grave, the grave of the eye, which is also, would be also very relevant for our age where the individuality, the real eye has been substituted by a copy and paste uh, uh, pseudo individual individualism you know that uh, means we all dress the same we all think the same or think we all have the same opinion we all uh, go to the same place on vacation therefore modernity is the time when the i dies this this concept you know this idea in, per se is also a little bit perverted because I mean, it means that you can fit uh, the eye into, I don't know how many uh, thousand differences. And if there is one thing that is deeply connected to the concept of the human eye, it's difference. And I mean, to have the same format for everyone, it's not that different every single detail of our society is filled with ideology from a, monu a pseudo monument that says hi to the colors we wear to the buildings the way they are built to the vacation packages that are offered or the, to the disposition of the workplace everything is fundamentally ideology you know in the past, when we had less education, and that's why we were more educated, you could just say polata deina, which is the beginning of a famous sentence by Sophocles, where, and it means the, the full sentences of Sophocles in the, in the Antigonus says, many, there are many wonderful things in the world, which means including animals, including trees, including nature, etc. But none of them is that wonderful as the human being. There are many wonderful things in the world, but none of them is as wonderful as the human being. Now, the Greeks, that were a million times smarter than the smartest people alive today, used a very precise word, or at least Sophocles, used a very precise word, which could mean wonderful, but also terrible at the same time. So if you translate that word, you can say there are so many wonderful things in the world and none of them is as wonderful as the man, but also there are so many terrible things in the world, but none of them is as terrible as the man or the human being. What was the word? Polata deina. You know, that's the beginning of the... Of the and it's, it's, it's an ambiguous word used on purpose 
to express this ambiguity that there is in human nature, this complexity of human nature that cannot be compared to the complexity of any other being in the world. And this is not, you see, if you talk to one sophist or to just the average uh, imbecile, he will say, oh, he would be, you know, indignant uh, by, by the fact that we say that the human being is special. Not understanding that by saying it's not, it's, it's also making a statement about himself or, her, or herself. But we really, somehow, I'm afraid, we have lost much of what of the concept of the human being. We have lost. We... I don't that's mean because I, I have no idea. I don't know why we have landed in in such a situation where we don't understand the greatness of the achievements of our species. I don't understand that. I don't know. I, I really to me there is no answer to that a, apart from probably the fact that these people making these claims have never heard of uh, the system chapel the the, the the Monshine Sonata, the, the, the Odyssey, the, the Divine Comedy. I don't know. They, they probably disregard these things, don't understand it. I don't know what's wrong. 